What's up, everybody? Welcome back. This is a great episode. How do you train for strength versus how do you train for size? You're going to like this one. But first, here's the free giveaway. Maps Aesthetic. One of you is going to win free access to Maps Aesthetic, but you got to do this. Leave a comment in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel. Turn on your notifications. Do all those things. If we pick your comment, we'll notify you. You'll get free access to Maps Aesthetic. Also, we're running a big sale right now on two workout programs. The first one that's on sale is MAPS Performance, Train Like an Athlete, Move Like an Athlete, and Look Like an Athlete. The second program that's on sale is MAPS Aesthetic. This is a bodybuilder-inspired program. Sculpt, shape, and build your body. Both of them are 50% off. Here's what you got to do if you want to sign up. For MAPS Performance, go to mapsgreen.com. For MAPS Aesthetic, go to mapsblack.com. And then the code for 50% off for either or both programs is FEB50. So do that code and you'll get 50% off. All right, here comes the show. So I, I have a, a cool conversation that I, I like to have with you guys that I think would be fun. And I'm real curious to hear. So I really, I really want to hear how you um, would separate these. Like I got a question not that long ago about training for strength versus training for hypertrophy. Oh, yeah. And I know we kind of talk about, uh, obviously, the, the the carryover and the benefits. and of uh, Hypertrophy uh, being size. size, size. Right, right. Yeah. So almost, almost like, okay, somebody who uh, like uh, identifies more as kind of like the, the bodybuilder look, I want to I sculpt my body, you know, hypertrophy, uh, versus somebody who I, I want to be strong, I care more about that. How... How is the training similar and how is it uh, different? And what does that look like depending on which person we're talking to? Yeah, well, also too, I mean, I think this is like a common misconception people have. Like they'll always look to the biggest person as like they're probably the strongest person in the room. Mm. And they just, uh, and I used to think that too, like for a long time until I actually really uh, understood weight training and how to, how, how different it is in terms of like the training and what that produces. Um, and so that was something that was a bit enlightening for me. Yeah. I mean, um, it is true. They're extreme, They're very closely connected, right? Cause mm. the truth is bigger muscle fibers, which is what hypertrophy is for the most part. There's other things that contribute to hypertrophy, like intracellular fluid and sarcoplasm, which is like, you know, it could be the capillaries and the, and the fluid and the fuel and that stuff that makes your muscles bigger, but ultimately bigger muscle fibers contract harder than smaller muscle fibers. So, and what's tough about comparing two different individuals is there's other factors that can contribute to strength. Right, but if yeah. we look at this at one person, that same person, if they have bigger muscles, those bigger muscles will contract harder. Now, does that mean that they're going to be able to lift more weight? Not necessarily. So this is where it gets kind of weird, right? Because a big part of strength is also skill. Mm -hmm. So you could have quads and hamstrings and glutes that contract harder than someone else's, but that other person might be able to squat more than you because they're well-versed in the squat because of the skill of the, of the squat itself. And, and strength athletes will tell you this. They'll tell you that, you know, that your, your technique and form and how you move the weight makes a big difference in, in how much you can lift. And this is something you learn through, through practice. What do you think that like, if you were to graph that, what that curve looks like? Cause obviously when you're brand new to lifting, both kind of come on pretty fast. Yeah. And do they do you think as you get more and more advanced that begins to kind of kind of split? It does that make sense? Yeah, it trying? does. I'd say strength happens first faster, right? Mm -hmm. Cuz you get that CNS adaptation, you're, you're able to fire the muscles a little better. Then what follows those strength gains tends to be muscle, and then they kind of stay pretty closely connected. We're talking about the average person right now, not not necessarily someone specifically for strength or just hypertrophy. They're very closely connected, and then I'd say then you get that split where you can focus mostly on strength or you can focus mostly on hypertrophy and you'll get more of which one you tend to focus on. Yeah. But I, I, it is clear that they're very closely connected, meaning you can't, it, it's a good idea to focus on both and you can't completely separate them because they're so closely connected mm. that if you improve one of them, even if your goal isn't to improve the other one, you're still going to get some of the yeah, other. Yeah, there's carryover from both directions. Tons of carryover. Well, so, and I want to make it clear, too, that because we're going to give kind of, I think, uh, general advice, yeah. right? If we were speaking to the strength person versus the hypertrophy person. But in my experience, one of the most 
common ways to help either one of those people is to introduce them to training more like the opposite one. Yeah, if that makes yeah. sense, right? Uh -huh. Like if you identify as a you know strength competitor or power lifter type, or you love to lift for strength, one of the best things a lot of times that person can do to get stronger is to train more for hypertrophy. Mm -hmm. And the same is true for the person that is seeking the next level of hypertrophy aesthetics. Yeah. Uh, is to how when was the last time you trained for strength or performance? And just because I think the most common thing is you neglect one or the other. Although I know we're going to go into some more. Like, hey, if you want strength, this is the ways more often than not you should train versus. Yeah, totally. And then we can't, we need to, uh, this conversation needs to include the central nervous system because yeah. it's what controls um, the muscles. It's what tells the muscles to contract. It's mm -hmm. also probably more importantly, what tells the, how, tells the muscles how to work together, right? Because f using the example of the squat, mm -hmm. you have a lot of muscles that are involved in moving the weight, like primarily the, the quadriceps and the glutes and the hamstrings. You have a lot of stabilizing muscles that have to stay tight and stable. Uh, pretty much the entire body needs to work together uh, to lift the weight. And how those muscles work together also determines you know, how much weight you can lose, uh, excuse me, how much weight you can, you can lift. Um, so the CNS plays a huge role and the CNS itself can fire harder or less hard depending on how well you train, how often you train right. and the state of your, for lack of a better term, excitement. So like, in other words, like you, you've all heard the, the, the story of the, the mom that lift the car, the burning car off their kid. Right. And people are like, how did she, how was she able to do that? Right. Under that extreme duress, the central nervous system kind of bap, bypassed yeah, its overrode. own. Yeah, it, over, it, it overloaded. Well, you have limiters. You have natural limiters in place so you don't get hurt and rip your muscle off the bone or, or cause like serious damage. And so there's actually a way for you to train to kind of squeeze out even more potential by, you know, telling the body that um, this is secure, this is safe, this is something that, you know, is not going to happen. That's the feedback you're getting back from your joints. Yes. So now your central nervous system is allowed to kind of juice it up. Here's an example that everybody can relate to, right? Imagine how strong you are if you're really angry versus if you're laughing. Have you ever tried to lift something while <laughs> you're silly and, and giggling? <laughs> no, I haven't. Make somebody laugh like, when they're bench pressing. Yeah. It's it's a good time. You, it, it, it like turns everything off, right? That's the CNS. The CNS is like, uh, we're not going to fire. You're laughing, whatever. Anger or sometimes fear, you get a lot more juice out of your body. Can you train your body to fire harder? Absolutely. Studies on like top Olympic lifters show that they probably can get like something like ninety something percent out of their out of their total potential. Which, right? by the way, I've seen the, mm -hmm. the studies around that the the average person or lifter is like half of that. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Crazy. So like you could take that person, same That's amount a of muscle, huge difference, huge, yeah, huge same drop off. same amount of muscle, get the CNS to fire harder, boom, they're lifting way more weight. Or take the average person, give them caffeine or a stimulant, which makes the CNS a little bit more excited. And then you see a you know five or ten percent increase in strength. So that plays a big role, and that's important to understand because strength training is also maximizing the CNS muscle building. Muscle training it's also a component of maximizing the CNS because a well uh, firing CNS is going to contribute to more muscle growth and activate more muscle fiber. Well, I just wanted to bring up to um, you know based on everybody's individual goals, there's the strength to weight ratio that uh, oh, you yeah, can yeah. sort of get affected by this, right? So if there is a way to get stronger without, you know, necessarily gaining a lot of size. And you see this with, you know, people that are super connected or um, even like, say, like a rock climber or somebody that's like really yes. super connected and strong, but like they're not, their body is, is adapting towards something that's going to be advantageous for their specific skill. So the, it, it's interesting that there's those differences, but if you look at them, like they're super strong, but the, it, you wouldn't know that based on their physique. No, that's a good point because let's say you're uh, playing football where you're tackling each other, there's no weight classes, and mass also plays a role in how hard you can hit. Yep. You, it, it's, pro it's probably a good idea to gain 15 pounds of, of mostly lean body mass, right? For the most part, unless the weight gets so high that your agility is off and all that stuff. But let's say you're in a weight class, you're a wrestler, you're a middleweight or whatever, and it's a 150-pound limit, and you want to get as strong as you can at 150 pounds. What you don't want to do is gain 10 pounds of muscle on top of it because now you're competing with guys who could be as heavy as 170 pounds. So now your strength isn't as effective. So, And that's those are the cases where it's like people are like, I just want to get stronger. And I've had that. I've had clients like that who are like, I can't gain any weight. I'm a motocross racer. I'm a rock climber. I'm a wrestler. 
or a boxer. I have to stay in my weight class, but I want to get stronger. So how do I do that without building muscle? So let's go over some general principles or rules yeah. that you would say speaking to these these two individuals. Totally. So again, understanding that strength is a skill, it makes sense that you would practice fewer exercises for more sets, right? So mm -hmm. if I'm trying to get as strong as possible in particular lifts, and today's leg day, and let's say my the, my number one exercise to get stronger at is the squat. It makes more sense to do eight sets of squats than it does to do you know three different exercises you know for a couple sets each or whatever. Now for muscle size, you see more of a benefit. And of course, in the extremes, it, it could get a little wonky and it doesn't necessarily it's not as necessarily as effective. But it makes more sense to hit the, the lower body with different angles. You're still going to squat, but you're also going to do sissy squats or lunges and stiff-legged deadlifts and different movements because those different movements hit the muscle differently and develop more muscle size, but not as much strength in that specific lift. So that's why you see power lifters spend an hour workout in the squat rack, whereas a bodybuilder does an hour leg workout and they're throughout they're walking throughout the whole gym. Well, again, this kind of speaks to the central nervous system in terms of learning, um, you know, a movement pattern yeah. and being most effective at that specific uh, skill. And so, if you treat it more as a skill, you know, your body's going to receive that information. It's going to you know react to it to get better and more efficient at that. And so, to add more sets just makes sense. You get more practice. You get stronger in that direction. Uh, and then, you know, the, the opposite side of that, we're challenging the muscle and trying to, to hit areas maybe we're not addressing within the muscle. Now, what someone might be thinking, because we talk about the importance of you're changing your exercise selection or your routine yeah. because of the uh, the benefits you get from seeking something that's novel. Now, what would you say to that? Because this is that's kind of goes against what we're saying for this person, right? This person wants strength, but for them, we're saying, hey, let's stick to these four or five movements consistently for an extended period of time, say a couple months even, instead mm -hmm. of rotating out of them like we might do for somebody who is wanting to chase hypertrophy. Yeah. Why is that? How would you explain that? Yeah, no, that's a mm -hmm. good question. It's, uh, it's still true. It's just not as true. In other words, you can go too extreme, right? You can only squat. In which case, you'll get good at the squat, and then you'll stop getting good at the squat. You might actually get worse at the squat because you develop imbalances. You start to develop aches and pains. So even power lifters do what they would call accessory work, where they're doing other exercises just to support the competitive lift of the squat. Um, with bodybuilding or hypertrophy training, variety is more important. But you could also go too far in that direction, right? You could go so far in the direction of variety that you never give your body the ability to get good at specific exercises. So you're never really able to maximize them because, you know, if you choose a new exercise or you do an exercise, let's say you do a specific exercise once a month because you rotate everything so much that only once a month I'm doing a squat. I never really get good enough at the squat to maximize its effect and push, you know, really good weight, right? Mm -hmm. So you can go too extreme in either direction. Yeah. So really it's, again, it's broken down like this. It's like, a strength routine would be fewer exercises for more sets. So let's say I'm doing 10 sets for chest for a strength ex, you know, workout. It may be two exercises, five sets each. For a bodybuilder type routine, it may be three exercises for three sets each and then maybe an extra set of, of something else. So more variety, but the volume is... Relatively and similar. a lot of that is because they care less about getting good at a movement. As a bodybuilder, I never cared about what my bench or my squat or any of these exercises are. I don't give a shit right. about that because it's not about being strong. Yep. So I'm chasing a look. And so I want to I want to follow an exercise long enough to reap the max benefits of what it was going of muscle it's going to build on my body. Then I want to move to something else so I can now reap the benefits from that. I don't care if I lose some of the benefits of getting stronger at that lift because I'm in pursuit of a look more. And so it's more advantageous for me to seek novelty if I'm more fo focused on hypertrophy versus strength. I want more of that CNS adaptation. I want to get good at the lift because that's going to make me better and stronger at moving that weight. Totally, completely. Yeah. And the CNS learns how to fire uh, more effectively in that specific way. The muscles learn how to stabilize and fire as a result better. You learn the positioning better. You learn the positioning of the bar Angles, better. Angles, leverage, The all technique, kinds of stuff, the yeah. leverage, you know, all that stuff. The CNF, because remember the CNS, it can fire generally, but it also is very specific, right? So mm -hmm. an Olympic lifter might not be as good at a deadlift as a power lifter 
but is going to crush the power lifter at like a clean because mm -hmm. and both of them can really fire uh, the CNS, right? So it can be much more specific. So when it comes to strength, it's like you want to practice fewer things more often to get that. And then for muscle, it's a little bit in the reverse, right? Now, what about rep range? We talk about the benefits yeah. of all the different rep ranges, and we say this a lot on the show, that anything between 1 and 25 has tre tremendous benefits for all pursuits. Mm -hmm. But again, if we were talking to a specific strength you know, person and a specific hypertrophy person, how would you advise each one differently? Yeah, so all the rep ranges are good, so you should probably train in all of them, but you're going to spend more time in a, in a particular rep range for strength and more time in a particular rep range for hypertrophy. Strength, it's, now we're, when we say strength, we're talking about kind of that bottom end, that bottom range grinding strength, because you could also have, you know, strength endurance, right, which is mm -hmm. higher reps and your ability to continue to go, after, you know, with, with short rest periods. I'm talking about like maximal low. That's yeah. the kind of strength that we're talking about. In that particular case, you probably, you're going to train in the low rep ranges much more often, you know, as low as one, but probably more often around four, five, and six in that range. And, and your goal isn't to fatigue the muscles a ton. Your goal is to somewhat fatigue the muscles. To generate as much force as possible. Generate as much force as possible and get really good at the lift and get really good at generating force within that specific lift. I also think that you would tend to flirt with the ends of the spectrum more often depending on which one you are. Meaning, if I'm a strength athlete, I'm going to find myself pulling singles and doubles and triples, yeah. you know, rarely frequently. Yeah. I want to be good at being able to do that and so I'm going to practice that quite a bit in in my in my routine where maybe if I was a bodybuilder I would do that to interrupt my training mm -hmm. occasionally but not very often and then the opposite is true for the strength or the uh, and then the strength athlete will every once in a while interrupt their routine with maybe tw a reps 20 reps but not very often because it's not getting as much of a benefit and then the other end of the spectrum yeah. with the hypertrophy person right they're yeah. rarely ever going to do singles or doubles maybe every once in a while to interrupt it they're going to lean more towards flirting with the 20 25 rep range more more often than the strength. Athlete. Yeah, the higher rep ranges that eight, you know, to 15 or so, even as high as 25, you get more fatigue, you get more damage, you get a better pump, mm -hmm. you get more muscle hypertrophy. I remember when we interviewed uh, Stan Efferding a while ago. Yeah. And he was Mr. Uh, 20 squats guy. Yeah, he was a power lifter, right? And he was like one of the strongest professional bodybuilders all, of all time. And he was mainly a power lifter for a long time. Then he hired a bodybuilding coach to help him get his, his pro card, and he wanted to put on more size. One of the main things he did was stop the, you know, the set, the three, four, five rep sets of squats and do like 20 reps of squats and, and lots of variety. He started doing leg press mm -hmm. and leg extensions and lunges. Whereas when he was powerlifting, it was like mostly squats. And what he saw was his strength didn't really go up because obviously not training for strength. But his size went up quite a bit. His legs grew. Everything grew quite a bit from training that way. So, and that was a great example because here that was an extreme example of what you could see right. when you train those extremes. Now, I want to reiterate what you're saying. Does that mean that training one, two, and three reps isn't going to build muscle? No, not at all. Does it also mean that uh, that training in the 20-rep range isn't going to help you build maximal strength? No, not at all. They all contribute to it. It's just you're going to spend more time on one end with one pursuit and on the other end. Well, yeah, because you, you have a, a very specific adaptation you're trying to acquire. So you're going to lean towards yeah. the one. The that, majority of your time needs to stay there. Yeah. yeah. It's going that's going to give you the biggest bang for your buck. They Yes, they all give you some bang for your buck, but the biggest bang for your buck is going to come staying towards that rep range mm -hmm. most of the time. And then intermittently interrupting it with the other end of the spectrum yeah. every once in a while and then going back to that. And yeah, I think totally. It's the same is true on both sides. Yeah, yeah. and I mean, I've, I, you know, some of the best, some really good power lifters that I've talked to, they say, oh yeah, I do, I'll run a cycle of more bodybuilder style training. And then I notice when I go back to my powerlifting training, I've got a little bit more muscle and I feel more stable Yeah, and I can generate more force when I get into it. And then you'll talk to bodybuilders and they'll say something similar in the opposite direction. Oh yeah, I'll do, you know, I'll do a month of, 
you know, five by five or I'm, you know, focusing on the, on the basic lifts, trying to get real strong. And yeah. I'll notice I get a, more of a granite hard look. And then when I go back to my bodybuilding they training, generate more force and power exactly. you know, within the I think lifts. not enough of them do it though. I mean, well, you, yeah, so they, I you, could, they used to, you, you have people like C bum and you have like, he's, he's big on it. You have uh Ben uh, Ben Pollock who obviously is cause yeah. he was come there. There's not a lot, at least in men's physique, I should say, maybe it's more popular in, in bodybuilding. You see some of these guys do that. But I was actually really blown away by how many men's physique athletes didn't take advantage of this. Yeah. They all thought, you know, the squatting and deadlifting heavy weight, the overhead pressing like heavy weight. I'm not a power lifter, I'm a strength athlete. Why do I why would yeah. I do that? I think we also we need to touch on though the the risk factor of lifting heavy, especially mm -hmm. when you start to get real big. That's probably one of the main reasons, right? You're you're a 250 pound bodybuilder, and when you start to train heavy, you're lifting weights now that if they get away from you, you can hurt yourself. Sure. And you know these guys and girls are are they're they're, they're so not interested and don't care about the weight that they're lifting that I think that they look at the risk and say ah, it's not really worth it. But the guys and girls that do it right are smart. You brought up Seabum. Yeah. I mean, when you see him doing, if you see the evolution of his physique, it's like he started squatting and deadlifting heavy and incorporating that into his routine, and he just started building more muscle, which just speaks to what we're saying, which is. You don't want to separate the two, in fact. First off, you can't, but you don't want to. You want to kind of train uh, a little bit of both. All right, here's another one, um, rest periods. You know, for strength, it's quite clear that, first off, you want if you're training, if you want to build strength, you should train strong. So what does that mean? Long rest periods. Yeah. Your goal isn't to fatigue the shit out of yourself no. and, and, and train your stamina or your endurance. Your goal is to do your set. Like if you ever watch powerlifters, I said they'll spend an hour in the squat rack. Watch them between sets. It's like five minutes in between sets. And they're yeah. hanging out and talking. And then they'll get under the bar and do three, four reps and then sit down and hang out for a long time. Bodybuilders don't do that. Yeah, Bodybuilders are moving all the time. If you're trying to maximize force output, you really need – like fatigue is your worst enemy. Uh, you need to be super focused and you need everything to be organized and to – produce all at once and so yeah it just it, it you, you need that that rest period to really recoup in order to perform at a high level uh in order so that way your body actually then um progresses forward and, and it learns how to do that you know most effectively yeah now i i did say bodybuilders are moving all the time which is true they typically will rest less than strength athletes however they can also benefit from again intermittently resting. It's the longer. same. It's exactly the same type of recommendation as the last point. Yeah, it's like you should spend most of your time in what you're saying, but going on the other end of the spectrum, you know, intermittently and to interrupt you training this way is a, a great idea. You just are going to spend most of your time in the like if I'm the strength athlete, most of my time is longer rest periods. But there's tremendous benefits for me doing a you know a short meso cycle of where I'm actually running that on the short rest periods and then going back to that and then the same is true for the hypertrophy client that's always training to look a certain way every once in a while hey let's run like a strength protocol and give you all kinds of rest before we go back to supersetting yeah. and short rest periods yeah I was influenced early on as a as a as a kid by power lifters and so I was a long rest period kind of person. And then I was convinced to try shorter rest periods and supersets and focus on the pump. And it was the first time in my life I saw my strength go down, but my muscle size go up. It was yeah. a very weird experience. Yeah, I had the same experience. It was very strange. I'm like, oh my God, I'm lifting less, but I'm building more. Now I'm lifting less because I'm resting 30 seconds, you know, or a minute between sets or supersetting. But I saw like, like muscle gains. And then when I went back to my longer rest periods, Man, I was so strong. So you know, basically, I mean, what you're saying, Adam, is is 100 goal. Like that's that's true. you know, though, it's 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 such a challenge for people to do this, though, because what happens is, at one point in your lifting career, you experience something like what you're saying right now. Somebody introduces you to a way of training, and you see like this huge change from that new stimulus or new way of resting or new way of lifting, and then all of a sudden you become married to that or 
you identify so strongly with a type of lifter, you know, like, mm -hmm. oh, I'm definitely more the athletic type. So I'm always doing yeah. hit training and plyometrics, you know, or oh, I totally identify with the strength guys. So I'm always lifting heavy and resting long periods of time. So that's the dangerous part about, you know, teaching people these like general principles about this type of an avatar is that somebody hears the advice, they go do it. Oh my God, they see great results. Now they're married to that one way. And it's important to know that, yeah, you should stay in that direction most of the time, but it's so good for you to interrupt that intermittently through yeah, your, your routine. I, I would say one of yeah. the best attributes of somebody who's got long-term success with, uh, speci specifically with resistance training, is an open mind. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would have to say that, right? Because had for me at least, you know, had I not had an open mind, I would have never tried kettlebells. Why? I dumbbells and barbells. Yeah. What the hell's a kettlebell? And I would have totally missed out, right? I would have never tried isometric holds or overhead carries. I would have never tried supersets or full body workouts instead of splits and, and vice versa. And every time I tried something, I saw the benefit. And what happens is you, it's, it's like a piece of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. And depending on your goal, some of the pieces of the puzzle are big and some of them are small, right? If you're a strength athlete, what a big piece of the puzzle is fewer movements, you know, more sets per movement, right? And a smaller piece is maybe more variety. And then if you're, if you're bodybuilder focused, it's, it's a little different. But all of them are pieces to the puzzle and you're missing something. If you don't have that that open mind, it's funny because the three of us are are you know like Justin's like one end of the spectrum, you're on the other end of the spectrum, and I'm kind of in the middle in terms of you know how we always train. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Although now all of us really understand the value. Yeah, we've of all everything. kind of taken from each other and applied it, and it's yeah, it totally translates. So it's like like you said, you gotta have an open mind, and it's gonna fulfill a lot of uh, holes uh, in your training, and you're gonna notice the difference. Although yeah. we still all kind of gravitate to the things that we're of, favorite. Of course, yeah, but we'll, I know we'll lean on our strengths. But I, yeah. I I incorporate other stuff. Way right, more right, and I, I think that's the I think that's the message to get across to people is like listen it's because there's always that other argument of like well if you don't love doing it you know that's more important right like it's important to love what you do and you love training a certain way yeah. but it's like it doesn't mean that there's not tremendous value for you just to interrupt that every once in a while so you continue to reap the great benefits of training that way so otherwise it allows you to do what you love more right yeah and, and more effectively right all right so this next one in my opinion is one of the most important aspects of strength versus muscle building and that's this. When you're trying to build strength, I am not focused on the target muscles. I don't care what muscles I'm working when I'm deadlifting or pressing or rowing or squatting. All I care about is moving the weight efficiently and effectively and in a safe mm -hmm. way. When I'm trying to build muscle- Good mechanics. So I, am, opposite. <laughs> I am trying to feel the muscle. Yeah. Like If I'm doing a barbell row for strength, it's about perfect form and movement. How do I get this movement efficient and get the barbell moving? When I'm trying to work my back with a barbell row and trying to build it, yeah. I'm like, can I get my back to contract can more? Can I squeeze, squeeze it? Can I feel it more? Totally. And this is the, I would say this is the biggest difference because the exercises could be exactly the same, but focusing on the movement yeah. versus- The, the intent changes everything. Totally different. Totally I, different. I wish that I had a video of when Justin and I first started working out together, you know, over a decade ago when, <laughs> yeah. we, when we first met because it would be the perfect- example yeah. of the two differences it's on how they train opposites. like everybody everything from the setting up for the movement to yeah. how we move the bar yeah. to the tempo how of the bar i would bench versus your totally. like slow control to yeah. i mean to, to a t you know i i train so much more like a, a bodybuilder hypertrophy guy just an absolute train more a athletic and strength and you could just tell that it had been, uh, you know, something that we had developed for so many years that every bit of our habits to get even ready for it and how wired. we move is so hardwired. So that's hilarious. So funny. Do dude. you remember when we went to Ben Pikulski's gym? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, of course and he, I do. Yeah, yeah and he, he took us through. It was so a, uncomfortable. Oh, it was so great. He took us through a bodybuilding workout. Yeah. And you know, you know, Adam and I, you know, we're kind of more used to like that feeling the muscle and the whatever. And Justin's a movement guy, hundred percent. I remember Pikulski kept correcting you. No, 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 do this. Oh, yeah. Slow down. He's getting dude. frustrated. Like, <laughs> I don't know what you're trying to do here, but I'm like going to do my own thing now. Yeah. Justin's like, I'm moving the bar. Like, what do you want me to do? Like, what else is supposed to happen here? You know? else? It's totally yeah. different. But I mean, it's, 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 look, if you want to develop your glutes when you squat, you, you, you squeeze and feel the glutes. You want to develop your quads when you squat. Well, you focus on the quads. 
when it's strength, it's like well, whatever and, works better to get the bar up so long as I'm safe in the form. Is well, and, and the important important part of that story is that they, they both have tremendous value. Totally. Right? They both have a ton of value. Like yeah. Justin's ability still to this day, if I were to compare him to his ability with any exercise that we do, to generate the most amount of force on command right away from his body, he's, he's so much better at it than yeah. I am. Like I just, it doesn't matter how much I try and prime and think about it and practice that way. I just haven't trained enough that way that he is getting, he has the ability to get mm -hmm. way more maximal force out of that. I would say what I'm great at is being able to on command con yeah. contract and, and activate Flex, a muscle. Squeeze, yeah, feel, sque exactly yeah. that as much as I possibly that. can, no matter how weird of a position or a movement I could be doing, I've learned to do that really, really well. Totally. All right. So this next one's about nutrition. Like how would you eat for size and for strength? You eat in a surplus. It, more <laughs> this calories. This is the only one that they're both exactly the same. Totally right? the same. Now, yeah. here's what's weird. Here's what's really weird. It, you can, it's, I would say, depending on the person, it's probably easier to get stronger in, a, in maintenance or a deficit versus building muscle at maintenance or a deficit. Both hard, but I could get somebody stronger in a deficit if I get them better at squatting or better at deadlifting. Oh, that's 100% true. To build mm -hmm. muscle in a deficit is like, that's like turning, you know, like lead into gold. It's like yeah, alchemy. It, it is alchemy. It's yeah. magic and it's yeah. it's very, very challenging And it's to extremely do. rare and it's most, if it is going to happen, it's most commonly going to happen in someone who's brand new. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so that's in true. spite of, they're just, they're just, those uh, results new are beginnings. happening regardless, right? It's not very common that you see somebody <laughs> who's in a caloric deficit that is going to build any now, muscle. Here's the big difference, and this is what's interesting. Strength, you can get stronger at lifts sometimes by gaining some body fat too. There's leverage improvements. Mm -hmm. The extra fat cushions the joints, makes things feel less painful. This is why power lifters and strength athletes aren't necessarily as ripped or lean as bodybuilders. Yeah. And when it comes to hypertrophy and muscle building, you know, I know there's people out there like, I just want to build muscle at all costs, but most people want to build more muscle. They could see more muscle. So they're less concerned about just overall size and more concerned with muscle and definition of the muscle. So the surplus, I would say, might be a little different. For example, if, if I was in a competition just to lift as much as possible, my surplus would be way higher. Yeah, because if, if you put a little build. bit of body fat it, on, it's you don't about really care. mass. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Not, not. Yeah, they're not deciphering whether or not you're consisting of mainly body fat versus muscle. Yeah. Now that being said, there you can still overdo that too, right? Totally. You could still you could still overconsume so much to where you're getting adverse effects, which I think. Yeah. So and I, and I think that in the in the powerlifting community, it's been accepted for a really long time to, to well, especially in the upper weight limits where there's no weight class. Yeah, yeah. to go just to go all out and yeah. it's like you know sometimes you see some of these guys and you're like you know what believe it or not he probably would benefit from leaning out a little bit <laughs> yeah. you know and, and right. that he's got to be over consuming like crazy and it, it it's not exactly a one-to-one -one. you gain more body fat you're also going to get a little bit stronger it doesn't always continue to scale yeah. like and I've, that. I've done that where i've gone so hard on the strength size where i'm like that's it i just want to get as strong as possible i don't care and i'll gain you know, 30 pounds of body weight, right? And my squat will go up, you know, 15 pounds. And then I'm like- Yeah, but the hmm. ratio. Yeah, right? and I'm like, wait a minute. I'm 30 pounds heavier and I can only squat 15 pounds more. Right. Technically, as a human, walking around and moving around, I'm You're weaker. technically stronger mm -hmm. lifting less weight at a lower weight. Yeah, like yeah. for my body, you yeah. know what I mean? Like yeah. I, I, my strength to weight ratio isn't very good. And that's what I meant by it's not a direct one-to-one -one ratio. Yeah. So you have to keep that in consideration. Even if your goal is to be stronger and you are now moving more weight, but if you put- 30 pounds of weight on just to move five more pounds away. You're technically a stronger person with, you know, with the 30 with pounds. With the bar, but yeah, but, yeah, but you're, but you're weaker yes. overall. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, not, not so great. Right. Pay attention to that. So ultimately what's the, what's the lesson here? Well, unless you're an athlete training in a specific sport, you're better off kind of messing with both training yep. with both. I mean, most people I'd say watching this, this, this show are interested in kind of like, well, I want to do this forever. Mm -hmm. I want to build muscle. I want to be strong. I want to have longevity. I want to feel good. Like, how do I keep the progress continuing as long as possible? Of course, at some point you'll hit a limit because otherwise, you know, I've, I've been working out for 25 years. I'd be bench pressing 6,000 pounds by now. What, 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 how can I keep things moving forward as long as possible and reach those limits in a safe and healthy way? Well, you do both. You go through cycles of both. You mm -hmm. mix them in. This way, like MAPS Anabolic, is literally 
the first phase is pure strength. The last phase is straight bodybuilding. And the middle phase is kind of both, right? Mm -hmm. That's the one of our original programs. And you'll yeah. see all of our programs kind of have components of this because, uh, yeah. you know, th th they contribute to each other. They all work together. Now, let's, I, I'm curious to how you guys, excuse me, would do this as far as like, let's say we have the strength person. And let's use our programs, okay. right? So if I'm going to use our programs to recommend for the, and then we'll say a year time. So oh, in a wow. year, we have a year time. Someone who wants to focus on strength, someone who wants to focus on hypertrophy. What what is what is the programs that you would recommend to them and for each each individual what, over the course of what a year? Now figure now so the audience who doesn't know if you don't have any of our programs, they're three months long. So basically, Usually, we're right. going to recommend four. We're going to recommend four programs. Let's say. Yeah. What does it look like for somebody who is in more of a pursuit for hypertrophy? Somebody who is more in pursuit of a uh, strength. What would you guys do? Would you recommend something like this? Let's say strength athlete is three cycles in a row of strong with the interrupted like maps aesthetic in there, or would you go, you know, one one or two rounds of of power lift? Excuse me, I didn't mean power strong. Lift, I meant power lift. Power lift with interrupt that with you know either anabolic or aesthetic, and then go back to power lift. Like what would yeah. it look like? Yeah, I would be strength athlete. I'd be like I'd go anabolic performance i think performance will be in both because uh if it, all it just the addresses yeah the, the joints yeah. and in and again to to secure that and feel stable yeah. so that way you can keep adding load and you can keep yeah. generating force yeah so i leave anabolic performance you know and then strong and power lift like that would be the strong at the strength athlete and then the bodybuilder one would be like anabolic performance and then maybe aesthetic and split yeah now what if, like what if i only split, allowed you guys to use PD. two programs just two. You programs. can only use two programs for each of these these so people to switch back, to and, forth switch back and forth or intermittently interrupt a, a cycle of them. You can only use two programs. We know. I mean, obviously, you know. Oh, I'd go. I'd go. I know. I'd go. Performance and power lift, That's or performance and aesthetic. That's what I would do. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Only because, yeah, yeah. Only because like per, like uh, power lift is like literally the the definition of just trying to get strong. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You and know, it's not lifts. a lot of unconventional lifts. It's just very one to one. I mean, you guys are both because you're throwing performance, and then you guys are pro taking care of the joints and thinking more trainers, dude. Yeah, yeah, I know. I mean, it's, I, hard, it's hard not for, to think that for way. maximum benefits for the aesthetic person. I would have ran. I would have ran something like aesthetic for most of the aesthetic or split for most of the year, and only interrupted it like in in the middle with like a, a power. Lift. I'd yeah. actually love to interrupt mm -hmm. sure. it yeah. with a power lift cycle in there, and then the rest is you know aesthetic. Or you know, split. throwing throwing maps prime pro for the joints, and then you're fine. I think right. You know, if we it, could do that, yeah. If we yeah. could do that, then then you're totally. I fine. mean, I get where you guys. Are. I mean, of course, you're you're being a responsible trainer. I'm trying to think more like uh, we're not we're not thinking general health. We're not thinking all the other things that you should. Well, yeah, I don't consider. want someone, someone's gonna hurt themselves. It's like, like pure strength, <laughs> pure pure hypertrophy. <laughs> what are the two programs I'm gonna focus you more on? I'm I'm thinking aesthetic. The person that wants the hypertrophy, it's gonna be more like aesthetic or split most the entire year. I agree with an interrupted with program power of power lift. Yeah, to get that. that. Makes sense. Yeah, and, and then on the other side, it's mostly power lift for the entire year and then just interrupt it with maybe anabolic or maybe aesthetic or one of those. Yeah, no, I can, I could definitely go with that. It's yeah. just hard to take off, take off my trainer. Hat. Well, I mean, <laughs> yeah. we talked about this in a recent uh, episode, right? Where we talked about, you know, performance we, we believe is probably the most important general program that somebody could run consistently yeah. because we did. A, we we. It, it's so focused on mobility and stamina and mm -hmm. endurance and moving in different planes. Like, it really is the one that will give you the best bang for your buck when it comes to I want to be stronger, I want to be leaner, I want to be fitter, I want to have endurance, I want to have stamina, I want my joints to be mobile. I can address yeah, all and don't that. forget like the first phase of mass performance is like it's like classic strength. Right, so yeah. you're still gonna build yeah. good muscle, mm -hmm. still yep, burn. Yep. I mean, you're still gonna get all those those general things out yeah, of it. Totally. So. I get it. Good deal. Look, if you like our information, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out all of our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any fitness goal. You can also find all of us on social media. So Justin is at Mind Pump Justin on Instagram. I'm at Mind Pump Sal on Instagram. And Adam is at Mind Pump Adam also on Instagram.